Hi guys, good good morning. Good morning. This is chapter two. Um, of course, what I'll do is I'll end up breaking this up into a series of lectures, and it's it's. I, would I say it's a big chapter? Probably, but we'll just get through it, and I probably will break after every TYU. Um, and this is a recording that will be part of the course, um, so you'll be able to find it in the playlist for financial reporting. Let's go. So first of all, we're going to look, of course, at the. Um, let's just quickly see what we're. I am following the textbook, by the way. I'm literally I'm working through the textbook and um, please that's how we treat this look through the textbook first and then do as many exercises in the workbook and then we slam through the exam kit so what we have here of course is just looking at this is really looking if you like at dealing with non non-current assets if you like and just really trying to understand what's going on with regards to also the conceptual framework <clears throat> and how we uh, recognize the um, non-current assets really so we're looking at defining the cost of a non-current asset um, what is the initial cost measurement of a non-current asset um, calculating especially when we sort of construct one so really what costs are allowed and what costs should be in and looking at this issue of capital and revenue expenditure which is nothing new per se for you um, this difference between enhancing and maintaining if you like the costs um, and then, of course, looking at subsequent expenditure. So you've sort of worked on your asset and then you're renewing the asset per se or um, improving the value of the asset and how we capitalize that and what costs are involved. We will also be looking at borrowing costs. So if you have borrowed um, money, if you like, to um, build an asset, the interest involved um, is now required to be capitalized. Um, when I was studying, you had the option of um, expensing it as, as an interest expense, but now it's required to be capitalized. So the question then becomes, how much of it can I capitalize? Can I capitalize it when on the down, if you like this, if there's a downtime and you're not actually making the product or producing, or if you like building the non-current asset, what happens to the interest that's being accrued over that period of time? Um, well, of course, in that regard, we expense it because it, it doesn't relate to at the active if you like construction of the of the asset um, and we'll see we'll play with that as well um, and then of course we have the option accounting policies of revaluation and let's see what happens in terms of the the journaling you're revaluing the asset and of course you have potentially having a gain do we recognize that gain in the income statement mm -mm, no we don't we recognize it in other comprehensive income um, and then later on, we'll probably talk about what happens when we now dispose of the asset and how that gain gets recycled, if you like. And just saying it now in advance, this is the thing. I'm going to try and make this in 10 minute short bites so that you can sort of do them in bits that way and sort of look at over the period. What happens with that gain? You then recycle it straight to retained earnings. So we cannot recycle it ever into the profit or loss. Um, and we'll probably look at the conceptual frame, how the conceptual framework justifies that type of that type of behavior. Um, again, like I said here, accounting for evaluation of non-current assets, as in the actual double entry and dealing with that. Um, talking about the gains and losses, profit on disposal, um, depreciation. Nothing new again. Um, depreciation based on the evaluation model. The truth is, nothing has really changed here per se. Um, when you revalue, well, when I say nothing much, there is a slight addition. When you revalue an asset. Um, you must also continue to depreciate and we'll play around with what happens with um, excess depreciation and how we can do a bit of recycling there um, as well and sometimes you can have I mean we're now at F7 so we we're not looking at our traditional one type of one build asset you can have assets that are made up of complex parts so typically the airplane the airplane has engines has wings has different body parts that have different years if you like so some parts of the of the airplane could, could last 20 years some parts could last five years so of course the right thing to do is to depreciate those assets in that in that order so to speak and to look at what's going on with the maintenance for those individual assets we will also go on to look at government grants um that's a completely different IAS, IAS 20. So typically with government grants, you have government grants that are related. The government can give you money to do with capital projects or revenue projects. And therefore, as you can imagine from an accrual point of view, you want to release that funding over the period or over the use or the time being spent on the actual project. Right. So if you get a grant for three years, 
debit bank credit deferred income and as you carry out the the project year on year you want to release the funding from deferred income if you like or if it's a capital project then you take all the income and hit the cost of the capital asset and depreciate it or you depreciate your capital asset as you wish as you recognize it the full thing and then you release the um, grant against de depreciation over the years as you use the the asset so you can see there that um you almost have a choice there, and we'll talk about that. A very popular standard, IAS 40, investment property. We live in England. Property is big. Everyone's always talking about it. So the standards, or if you like, the standard preparers thought it useful to prepare a separate standard to deal with people who, where the intention, if you like, is to buy property, to rent it, to sell it. You can see that this, the, the approach and the dealing of this will be different from, say, you buying an asset uh, sorry, you buying a non-current asset for the generation of income, if you like, uh, to gain economic benefit. So it's very different standard here. So really, we don't technically, just on the front, uh, just to highlight the key point now, we do not, if you like, depreciate these assets. We're typically revaluing them because there is a relevance there, isn't there? Because the intention is to, if an opportunity comes up, you will sell the asset, um, if, if you like. So um, we will look at that as as well. Um, so yeah, let's, um, let's jump in. Yeah, let's jump in. At least we'll go for another, um, a few minutes and then I'll take a short break and we'll do it like that in bits. So PPE IAS 16. This is, if you like, the standard that looks or addresses the, again, we're talking about property, but we're really talking about property, plant and equipment that is held by the entity for more than one accounting period. That is the intention. It's, there's no intention to sell this asset you see you know so you can see these fancy drawings here really showing you almost like a factory the intention is to keep that asset and to use it for the production if you like a supply of goods or services and of course for rental or other admin purposes so an office building of course as well would work here but we're not talking about like say um, property where you're renting out to people and and selling it Okay, great. Now, what's interesting is that um, I know we haven't studied the conceptual framework, but um, this standard is that powerful, right, that it retains the old former definitions. It's not a major definition, major differences. These aren't major differences, but it retains um, the, the old definitions of what assets are. If you like, um, the, the conceptual, the new conceptual framework has a slight twist on what the definition of an asset is. Um, but this really holds on to what we've always defined um, an asset to be. And we recognize an asset when it is probable when th that future economic benefit um, associated with the asset will flow into the entity and that it can be measured reliably. So typically with the um, conceptual framework, there are two underlying main qualitative characteristics, and that's relevance and faithful representation. So faithful representation really deals with this question of can we measure, I mean, there's a number of things, be neutral, free of error. Sometimes I wonder why I write <laughs> neutral, free of error. Um, and this measurement reliability, can we um, measure reliably um, the cost of this asset, which means, um, I don't know, Typically, is, is there a clear transaction cost? You know, is there a title? You can clearly see what's going on, uh, which is why many assets just never make it onto the statement of financial position because they are either internally generated, we can't quite separate them from the rest of the actual physical assets we're actually looking at, if you like, which is why we don't recognize internally generated goodwill. We don't recognize internally generated assets, um, intangibles, typically. Typically, until it's time to sell. Right. Um, and, and relevance is really to do with materiality. So you can use that as a starting point. Um, so anyway, the cost of the asset can be measured um, reliably. Um, and an item um, should be initially measured at cost. So I'm sure you would know this carrying over from all your work that you've been doing in financial, when I say financial reporting, gentle financial reporting, even financial statements with um, trying to understand the initial accounting concepts, the concept of historical cost, if you like, that's always, the, or the cost concept as it, were, as, as it is called, and you'll still find these concepts sitting very much within IAS 1, IAS 1. Okay, so it, the argument is that if you're building this thing right, the intention is to include all the costs involved in bringing the asset 
to its working condition all the costs now, nothing new here again i'm sure you remember some of this material so it includes the initial cost um, the capital cost such as the cost of the site preparation delivery costs installation costs borrowing costs i mean we'll talk about this again like i said earlier on this is all the the interest costs related to to um if you like um that you borrowed money to to spend to make this um revenue costs of course typically should be written off so costs that are maintaining the value and, and not exactly enhancing it again nothing new per se we know should not be capitalized so we're really it the, the argument here is we know it's credit bank i'm just arguing per se let's just assume you're paying for it the question is who are we debiting am i debiting you know asset or my debiting expense and of course we know why people wish to debit the asset because it means you can then release the expense over a number of years as opposed to hitting the accounts with all of that in one year right <clears throat> dismantling costs this probably is new when i say is new i'm not sure if you've done it maybe at a lower level if you've come through a university program you probably have definitely have seen it if you've come through at level four i doubt it i'm not sure but the key point here is that um this is really a question of prudence uh, um, and responsibility accounting if you know if there is in fact if there is a constructive obligation that in a number of years that you would be i've gone past my time let me just see here um i'll just talk about this yeah and then i'll i'll, I'll yeah i'll talk about i'll just highlight this and then i'll i'll cut and then go to the next take, take break so dismantling costs so the key point here is that if there is a constructive a constructive obligation is enough there might be a legal obligation so for example typically think of oil companies that will go in to a place and they'll set up a rig the key point is at some point they have to remove the rig so there's a cost in itself if you like of cleaning up so cleanup costs that might happen in the future in the future so we must recognize these costs as well even though we have we we we, we will be paying for these costs later on in the future we need to recognize if you like the present value of those costs i mean that's okay we can it's like any loan structure i think that's important to to recognize that you can recognize that cost as part of your investment the present value of it now and credit if you like some deferred liability right now if we, all you're doing every single year right is incurring this if you like interest expense or finance cost so to speak and crediting the liability until you finally pay in the end so imagine when you now get to whatever 20 years from now you now debit this deferred liability and credit bank to clean up the place right so this is not in itself anything special we are just recognizing we're being prudent we're being um, it's i would say it's being complete i think it's faithful representation um i will say typically if it's it's relevant if this cost is material so to leave it out doesn't give us the the, the, the true value or faithful picture if you like of what the, the value of that asset of that asset is okay great stuff my plan is to stick with it in 10 minutes <laughs> to give you time to sort of watch this and come back and watch it and just get through it um, and i think that's the best way to tackle these type of things as opposed to sitting there in one massive one massive hit to, to, to do this okay great stuff i'll see you in part two